Good morning, Doug Blizzard here with Catapult. Welcome to our event today. We're excited to have our friends from Hub here on the line. And uh, before, we, before we introduce them, I just want to go through a couple of administrative issues as we always do uh, for our webinars. We are recording this. So if you if you have to drop off or you, or you find that you need to send this to somebody else and your company needs to hear this, we'll send a link out to that uh, probably later today or tomorrow at the latest. So you can do that. Um, if you have questions, please use the little uh, command bar there and type your question in. I believe they're going to take kind of questions throughout, some pausing throughout to, to get to those. So uh, <clears throat> happy to answer those. Um, and again, we're just glad you're here. This is a topic that uh, we find that, that companies tend to kind of come in and out of this topic. You know, they they care a lot about healthcare at certain times of the year and other times they don't. But obviously, when we think about Gosh, I probably had this discussion 200 times with the company. We can't find people. We can't keep them. Um, healthcare hasn't always surfaced as, as something that can help you find and keep. And so I like today's topic around, because a lot of us feel like kind of trapped where we are. There's no other option. We kind of have to do what we've always done. You know, we've talked about the merry-go-round before, of the merry-go-round of the various options. And so just excited to let you kind of get into the minds of, of, of a very uh, uh, p good, positive, progressive uh, uh, bro brokerage consulting firm like Hub, and just see what 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 they got, what they think about this, and what what they recommend to help you kind of think through your healthcare journey, uh, it, because it can be a journey. I and mean, a lot of us, it feels sometimes like it's not really a journey; it's kind of like a spinning in one uh, one map location. But we're going to learn today there are options, there are ways to look at it that, that can help you. And so. With that, uh, I'm very thrilled to introduce uh, Donna Bishop with Hub, who will start this show and uh, and get us going. Donna, welcome. Thank you, Doug, and good morning, everyone. We are absolutely delighted to be with you and appreciate Catapult affording us the opportunity to educate a bit today. Um, we really this this event really sprang from an opportunity that we had with Catapult to talk through some of your concerns as members. So we really wanted to take you through the renewal process from pre-renewal to post-renewal and addressing those concerns. So in the interest of recapping and kind of setting the stage, those top concerns in order of most concerned about to least concerned about were that employees are paying too much out of pocket for their insurance, that employers are paying too much in premium, the specialty drug costs are out of the site, um, healthcare is too complex, and there's no transparency in claims and data. What we see often, to echo what Doug said, is that the conversation about employee benefits really occurs right at renewal, and there's not a lot of conversation about it throughout the year leading up to, which means that we're not really going in with a strategy, we're reacting to a renewal. So we really wanted to kind of take you through from a tactical perspective what you can do as an employer to really address what those top concerns are. Now, as Doug said, we will be taking questions, so put your questions in the chat. Um, we'll go through the, each step, and at the end of each sort of segment, we'll address any questions that have emerged, and perhaps more questions will come from that. So with me today, I have Matt Estrella, who is our Director of Consulting for Hub Carolinas. Um, Hub, Matt oversees all of Hub's employee benefit consultants and helping them sort of serve their clients better. Um, so also we have a world traveler, David Dow with us. David is an advisor here at Hub. And so David is really more on the front end of the conversation before you become a client and then after you become a client and sort of the overarching strategy of your business beyond the employee benefit program. So we want to start this conversation with a pre-renewal planning process. This is where you can address a lot of the costs that, that you all are feeling and have been feeling for years and years. Um, there's one thing that I've heard David Dow say a number of times, and that is that disruption is not your enemy. We do tend to sort of do what we do because that's what we know we can do, and that's what we're familiar with. So I wanted to talk to Matt and David today about their individual perspectives on disruption, and from a consultant point of view and an advisor point of view, why is the disruption not our enemy? What's great about disruption? Matt, I'll let you go first. Thanks, Donna, and good morning, everyone, and, and uh, really excited to, to be here with uh, the Catapult membership. Um, so why is disruption not our enemy, right, and, and sort of the perspective on that? Um, you know, there is that fear from employers and employees of, of, of making uh, changes to any type of benefit plan, but sometimes those changes yield a lot of positive uh, results. Right, we're seeing the marketplace constantly evolve. 
we're seeing new options constantly become available to employers. There's different funding mechanisms. There's various health and performance programs that can be put in. There's new types of plans that are out there, right? And, and as an employer, you wanna make sure that you are reviewing and understanding all of those options. Because whether you're a small or large employer, um, you, you have several different choices available to you each year. And you shouldn't let the fear of not making a change limit what you actually look at, uh, uh, the types of programs you look at each year. Uh, because not only will uh, you possibly achieve cost savings, uh, but there's also program enhancements. And that's really what your employees feel, right? Your employees will, will feel all of those benefits and perks um, that are available um, in the marketplace. You know, the health, the health plans specifically landscape today looks very different than it did five years ago, not only from options, but from all of the things that traditionally only larger employers could offer, we've seen a lot of that come downstream. So I know we'll get into a little bit of that um, uh, during today's presentation, but that's really sort of always my overarching message to employers is, you know, let's make sure we look at all the choices and let's not let the fear of change limit what we're willing to consider. Thanks, Matt. That's great. Um, David, I know when you talk about disruption, you talk about funding mechanisms being more of the disrupting force. Can you talk to us a little bit about your thoughts on that and why we should embrace that? David? Uh, we may have lost our Londoner. We may have lost David on audio, but you know, I can, Donna, why don't I step in and, and, and cover that? So, um, one of the what, like what Dave, a lot of what David was going to to cover was going to talk about. There's three general funding mechanisms for health insurance, right? There are fully insured medical plans, which many on the line today may be very familiar with. That's where you get a plan from a Blue Cross, United, Cigna, or Aetna. You pay them a premium. You you agree on that uh, uh, ahead of time, and you pay that premium for all 12 months. A very common way to insure your medical plan. Then there's sort of what's like that that next step uh, towards what I would consider like plan transparency, uh, and that's called level funding. And that's a hybrid, basically, of a self-insured and a fully insured medical plan, where um, there is there is an agreed upon premium that that's level set for the whole year. There's claims reporting, uh, and there is. Um, um, is the ability, if the claims run favorable to you as an employer, to get some of those to get some of those uh, claims savings back to the employer. And then the third way, which is uh, what we're seeing more and more of, particularly over the last several years, again going downstream towards smaller employers, is self-insuring. So self-insuring is where uh, the employer puts in some some different types of mechanisms uh, to protect themselves against large claims but the employer is taking on paying the smaller claims, right? So we have those types. And again, as we talk about disruption uh, as an employer, really, you know, if you're an employer of, I would say anything above 50 employees, you wanna consider all of these choices, right? Because there may be a, one of those three scenarios may be a, you know, may be a fit. It's impossible to tell here, right on this webinar, which is the best fit, but just know all three are a fit and you should be doing a, a deep dive into all three um, at least once every few years, if not more often, because you wanna know what's available in the marketplace and which of those programs benefit you as the employer. Thank you, Matt. So I know as, as an advisor, so I'm out talking to prospects and clients on a daily basis, and a lot of times if the subject of self-funding or level funding or anything beyond fully insured arises in a conversation, there's always this assumption that, that there's a huge risk and that you're really putting your company's bottom line at risk if you, if you go to a self-funded program. Can you kind of address for the audience why that's not necessarily the case? Yeah, absolutely. So I always like to think about, I always like to tell employers that no matter what, ID card you're carrying in your wallet, the claims are going to be the claims next year, right? The employee that's having to have a knee surgery next year, 
they're going to have a knee surgery regardless of, of who's insuring you and how you're insured. Self-funded in those level funded plans, they have mechanisms in place called stop loss insurance, which if you've never heard the term stop loss insurance, it's basically protection for you as an employer. So it's protecting you, the employer, against that very large individual claim or as an aggregate, your entire uh, uh, you know, employees, their families, the aggregate number of claims. So, you know, when, when, when we look at an employer, you know, we're making sure that we're putting in those safety mechanisms in place where, we have, where we're analyzing the entire financial funding of the plan to make sure that the employer is protected against those large claims, but they are paying those small claims. And, and pay, by paying those small claims, that's where the employer gains a lot of control, right? Because when you're looking at one of those self-funded plans, again, regardless of your employer size, um, impacting those smaller claims is where the employer can continue to offer a great benefit plan, offer enhancements to the benefit plan, while also offering some unique cost containment measures that will impact the bottom line, while not, you know, gutting or changing your medical plan that, you know, like, like many employers are used to over the years, right? In the fully insured model, which again, this is not a fully insured versus self-funded conversation. This is solely to sort of understand the differences, but, um, you know, many employers have had that, um, ha have had to have that, that, that decision where they either have to change a carrier or they have to change their deductible or change some structure in the medical plan. And we see less and less of that in the self-funded model because we can put some other mechanisms in play that is not directly impacting the employee. So um, again, you know, as you think about, you know, this this reviewing your plan before you're renewing, you know, as an employer, these are the types of things you should be reviewing, you know, 150 days out or so, right? You know, this is not the, you're not reviewing this inside of 90 days, right? Because you're in a kind of a mad dash to make decisions, get employees enrolled, get everyone their ID card. This conversation needs to happen about three months prior to that so that you're understanding what your options are as you head into that renewal season. Great, thank you, Matt. So I, one of the things that I hear probably more than anything else these days is the cost of pharmacy. We've seen um, a lot of coupon programs come into play. We've seen some local companies that are really exciting, Make ORX, for example, that are offering some alternatives to the traditional pharmacy arrangement. So I, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about what you're seeing out there and, and how it's implemented. Is it easy to implement? Is it something that, that clients should be considering? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, if anyone's, you know, and, and many on the line, maybe you don't pay that close attention to it, but, you know, the, the, the fastest rising component of your medical insurance plan is pharmacy cost, right? There are so many complex medications uh, being developed today that are really effective against major illnesses, but that comes with a cost, right? And, and, and the medical plan is, is, is funding that. So, well, we're seeing, okay, first, you know, let's kind of look at the fully insured medical plan side. So again, those traditional type medical insurance plans that, that, that uh, you know, most are, are accustomed to. Well, you know, we're seeing the carriers put in uh, some, some, some cost control measures in place. Some of that includes limiting the, 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 which pharmacies you can go to, right? Maybe your medical plan is you need to go to, every pharmacy other than Walgreens or every pharmacy other than CVS, for example. You know, that, that could be one measure. Uh, other measures we're seeing is that, you know, the, the, those medical plans, they're putting in mechanisms on the back end where they're able to scan and see, okay, when, a, med when, a, when a, a member goes to fill up medication, they're scanning to see what type of, of, um, of discounts are available against that copay or against that cost. You know, by scanning good RX or some of these other types of uh, prescription drug savings programs. So we're seeing that on sort of the fully insured side. Again, that's sort of happening without any employer or member um, action. On the self-insured side, 
we get to see a little bit more engagement, not only from the member, but from the uh, but 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 from the plan, from the employer and the plan. So we are see, you know, you can put in a pharmacy benefit plan where, and I'll use Mako as an example, Donna, since you mentioned them. Um, Mako RX local in in Raleigh. Uh, we have employers out in the market in this region that are using Mako as what's called their pharmacy benefit manager. So that's who's managing the uh, the prescription drug program. And they have a program where they have about 700 medicines commonly used, mostly generic, where if you're getting those filled at a locally owned pharmacy, so not a chain, those prescription drugs have no cost. Okay. So why is that? Right. So, you know, Mako knows that and, and all, all pharmacy benefit managers know that those generic drugs uh, for, again, commonly treated medical conditions, cholesterol, thyroid, blood pressure, um, uh, some mental health type medications like anxiety or depression, uh, all those commonly used medicines are generally pretty low cost. Right. And, and if, if, and Mako's, uh, model is driving you to locally owned pharmacies um, and, you know, engaging with that local pharmacist. There's additional conversations that happen there and provide the member with little or no cost for those medicines. And then the employer on the employer side, the employer is funding those prescription drugs, right, as part of the claims, but they're lower in cost, right? But then you get to the other side of it, which is those expensive specialty medications that many of us have heard of or we've seen the commercials on TV for, right? So in there, we have these pharmacy benefit managers working with the drug manufacturer and working with some other type of uh, prescription discount programs to afford savings, not only to the employer, but to the member, right? And, and this gets to sort of that second and third level of, of review, you know, when you're trying to develop your medical plan, um, you need to be, you know, as an employer, I think, you know, you need to be looking at all of these types of things, right? You wanna be addressing those low cost drugs that are, are, the volume is high, but the cost is low, but there's still a cost. And then you also wanna be addressing those expensive medications we're talking thousands of dollars in cost per month but what are the mechanisms in place and they are out there that you should be working with your broker or consultant on to help uh, also not only make those medications accessible for your employees and their family members but also help m make those more affordable right so and that's what we're seeing again that's what we're seeing the market evolve into thanks Matt. So I know um, you have a very special client um, here locally that you've been able to incorporate a program called Hero Healthcare with. And that has been a really exciting thing to see unfold and to try to wrap around some of our clients personally. So I would love it if you would speak to that, speak to kind of how it's enhanced this client's health plan and um, kind of how, you know, how does it fit in with the greater scheme and the greater strategy inside the health plan? So who is that special employer? Well, that's Catapult. So um, uh, in 2021, um, Catapult may, uh, decided to make the uh, move forward to uh, self-fund their health plan, just like we've been talking about over the last few minutes. Um, and they added a program called Hero Health, which some on the line may have heard about it. There's been some other uh, webinars over the last 12 months, you know, sort of highlighting the perks, but what's made Hero Health so effective at Catapult is first and foremost, the leadership at Catapult's commitment towards seeing the program through. And, and, and that, that part cannot be understated because if the leadership is not 100% fully committed to the program, it's my belief that employees and their families will not will also not be committed so that's first and foremost i mean uh it's really important to get to give that credit so the hero health plan is there are the components where it's a traditional self-insured health plan right we have the things we've talked about we have stop loss insurance to protect against those big claims or those aggregate claims 
We have a third party administrator, which basically provides the customer service uh, to employees and their families whenever they're, you know, maybe, um, uh, you know, running into a, a question or, or a concern that they have. Uh, there's a provider network. So that's your list of doctors and hospitals, you know, that are on that ID card that allow, uh, you know, where you go and you pay your copay for uh, a doctor's visit or you go to the hospital because you have to have a surgery. Right. There's the prescription drug program, Mako RX, right? Just like we talked about, that's a part of it. And then we have um, the Hero Health sort of add ons. And this is where we take the catapult plan to that next level of consumer engagement um, and quality delivery of healthcare. And how do they do that? Well, one of the key components of the Hero Health plan is they have a nurse navigator on uh on their medical plan um the nurse navigator is basically that concierge nurse that's available to all employees and all family members and she helps everyone in the catapult family find the right type of health care answer the questions that they have uh, address concerns that they have, right? Someone is diagnosed with a new medical condition and they want uh, to talk to someone, they call the nurse and talk it through and, and you know, assess things. The nurse also helps those members review and um, decide on which types of providers and which providers that the members want to use. Now, understand, Members can run on, run the plan on their own like they've always used to. They don't have to use the nurse. It's a great benefit to use the nurse navigator, but they don't have to. But if they do, what the nurse navigator, and, and, and her name in, the, in this case happens to be Faith. What employees and dependents can do is they can call Faith and they can, they can call Faith and say, Faith, you know, I've been told I need an MRI on my knee, uh, not sure where to go. My doctor happens to be with, you know, ABC Hospital. They want me to go down the hall. That's fine. But are there any other choices for me? Because I know that MRI on my knee is going to cost a couple thousand dollars and my deductible is a thousand dollars and all those things. Well, Faith has providers where she can send that member where there is no cost to the member if they use sort of one of those um, independently owned radiology groups in my example, right? So. That's a huge component of what what uh, what Hero can do. Another big component is there's other healthcare services that are no cost. Um, urgent care facilities. There are certain urgent care facilities across North Carolina that if a member goes to one of those urgent care centers, no cost um, for the urgent care visit. The medications we talked about, no cost telemedicine no cost right so there's other components where again not only i know you know i've mentioned a few cost items but what uh, faith is delivering is also high quality right quality of care is not going to be put aside solely for cost right we're what what hero what the hero program is trying to do is to trying to deliver quality outcomes while achieving cost savings. Both of those things can be done, right? They're not completely independent of one another. But what we need is we need visibility into the plan. We need visibility into the providers. And that's what the overall catapult plan does. And again, I go back to sort of my first point, which is the leadership at catapult are 100% completely committed into this. It's a, it's a different way to do healthcare, right? But it's what we have found at Catapult over the last 14 months or so, it's a very effective way to do it. Thank you, Matt. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about um, planning and, and being more strategic before your renewal is released. Um, and before we move on to talking about the initial renewal, Doug, are there any questions in the chat box that we should answer before moving on? Uh, yeah, we just have one. How does HERA work with a high deductible health plan? Or things okay. like that? How do these, these plans like that work with a high deductible plan? Okay, so 
I'm a high deductible health plan. Uh, I'm going to take that as meaning a plan that is HSA compatible, where you can have a health savings account. So Hero works. However, those items where I mentioned where you can have the health, the the some of the services at no cost before the minimum deductible has been met the member would have to meet a deductible. So you can't have, like, so the IRS requires that if you're going to have a uh, health savings account, you have to have a compatible high deductible plan and the member cannot have any um, uh, first dollar uh, coverage um, until they meet their minimum deductible. Okay, so under the example, if you have a high deductible health plan with an HSA, you can still have the hero program. You can still use the nurse navigator. It's just that when you would, uh, until you meet your minimum deductible, uh, you would be paying, you know, out of pocket like you would on any other medical insurance plan for those urgent care visits or telemedicine or those uh, prescription drugs. But again, it is still available in that structure, right? And again, one of the biggest components of the hero health plan is utilizing that concierge nurse navigator again in catapult's case faith because faith can still identify right faith can still identify an mri on on your knee could cost twenty five hundred dollars at one facility and across the street it could be fifteen hundred dollars you have no idea that 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 uh, you as a as a consumer have no idea the two costs faith does she has all the back-end information so that's still a really, really important value, regardless of the type of plan you have. Thanks, Matt. So let's move and on. Matt, and, and Donna, Donna. Right, yeah. So okay, David. I, I, I've tried to be really quiet because uh, technology has failed me a couple of times, but uh, I might have a stable connection. Um, I want to make a couple of comments on the first section before we moved on. Absolutely. You know, a, a few years ago, some of the, you know, I imagine the people um, on this call are saying, gosh, that sounds so different. Gosh, that sounds, you know, I'm worried about what my, my employees are going to feel. You know, what, you know, it's a tight employment market. We just have 30 employees. We just have 70 employees. Um, you know, and, and five to 10 years ago, I would say every single fear that everyone has on this call is 100% correct. But today, it's just, you know, we can easily set aside many of those fears because the actual employee experience, as Matt's talking about having a nurse and having this and having another layer, you know, I can imagine people saying, gosh, it sounds so different, so strange, so weird. What we're talking about, folks, though, is really having a very traditional feeling health plan. What we've done is we've changed the funding mechanism, just what sits underneath the plan, how the money's collected and redistributed for claims, to a model that just simply gives us flexibility. I mean, that's all we're trying to do at the end of the day is gain flexibility, control, and get some data uh, to then make better decisions as we move forward instead of picking and guessing from spreadsheets every year. So, you know, uh, what, what I would encourage is for everyone this call to just be open-minded. And what you're talking about, Donna, you talked about strategic planning. You know, having those conversations six, nine months out, often as soon as you wrap up the previous year's renewal, you know, go to the beach, take a vacation, take a breather. But you know what? Two months later, dive into it. When you have no deadlines, no pressure, uh, it, the, the renewal is as far out as it can possibly be, and just talk to your advisor uh, about strategies and, and what might apply to you. Uh, you know, if you've got 30 people and say, well, this doesn't matter, this doesn't apply to us, well, there are self-funded strategies that are applicable, very applicable for 30 employees. Um, you know, talk about Catapult. Catapult's the 800-pound gorilla of HR consulting, and nobody's better, no one's bigger, but Matt, how big? I mean, how big are they? Yeah, about uh, 70, 60, 60 to 70 employees. Yeah. So, you know, we're not talking about uh, strategies that are being implemented for two and three and 500 employees or 1,000 employees. These are really cool features that we're, in most cases, layering on top of a very traditional family plan. You want to go to your doctor, you want to have a familiar network with a United Healthcare or a Cigna or a Blue Cross or a MedCost doctor and have that familiar card in your wallet. Every one of our self-funded clients has that card. 
right, Matt? I mean, we don't have a client that has some, you know, screwball plan that they can only see four people in town. Every our client has a, a national network. They, they go to their doctor. What we're talking about at the end of the day is adding to, not taking away, but adding to the employee experience, the member experience to drive a better outcome, to, to provide more information, to provide a better health outcome for themselves, which often translates into a better financial outcome for the employer who's footing most of the bill. So, you know, broadly, I know we jumped right into one model pretty quickly, but broadly speaking, that's, that's all we're doing. That, that's, what we're, that's what we're talking to our clients about, and that's what your broker should be talking to you about. And I hope, and I hope that doesn't sound too scary uh, to anyone on the call. So we had a, we had a question, we had a question, Donna, which, which if it wasn't asked, I would have asked it. And that I've often said, uh, you know, that people aren't always rational when it comes to healthcare, and they're less rational when it comes to their kids' healthcare. And so, this is this is us. I'm, 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 we've had a great experience. But I'm just curious, how do you talk to those employers? You feel like, oh my gosh, this has changed, as David said, and I'm just concerned that this might involve an extra step or two that perhaps that employee that just got a bad diagnosis or has some frustrating condition they're trying to figure out what's wrong with them doesn't like the fact they've got to call someone or go somewhere speak to that how do you address that kind of stuff yeah doug hey david here let, let me jump in i know you said donna but listen can i've been doing this for 23 years can anybody can any of us be more frustrated with the system that we've had in place for the last 25 30 years so let, let's start with that question in mind you know, we've made the reactionary decisions with no information. Like you said, Doug, maybe just getting life-changing news. We don't know what to do. So great example is for many of our self-funded clients, we add in, again, not take away, we add in a cancer specialty, an oncologist group that does nothing but manage the member experience, the um, uh, review the test, seek out uh, centers of excellence across the country, uh, help members and their family members to understand the news they've been delivered, their treatment options, uh, look at the test, 25% plus of cancer tests are either misdiagnosed or misstaged. So they are making sure that you get accurate diagnose, diagnosis, accurate staging, and then world-class treatment. Who wouldn't want that in that case, Doug, that you just specifically mentioned. Horrible news. I'm terrified. Who wouldn't want that? So that's what we're talking about, adding to, not taking away. Sorry, sorry Donna. Once no I get fired up, I get fired up. Yes, we know. Um, we love that you're passionate about it, though. Um, so, Doug, to add to what David had said, I do think that any transition like this in terms of delivery of care, you are going to periodically have resistance from some of the employees, depending on what the situation is. But I think what happens over a period of time, and, and Matt, you probably can corroborate this better than anyone, is that when a program is first implemented, you're, you're always going to have some skeptics in the beginning. But once it's implemented and people have begun to have success stories that they share with their coworkers, then I think you see a broader acceptance. Um, there's never going to be a program that you're going to be able to roll out without any resistance at all. So I think if you're committed to your strategy and you understand what your strategy is for the benefit program and why you're doing what you're doing, um, to kind of echo Matt's sentiment, when the leadership is really bought in and is passionate about what they're trying to do for the employees, I believe that most employees understand that the employer is really trying hard to give them something of value that is appropriate for what they need. So there's a lot of education involved in this process. And, you know, if, if you're embarking into a program like this where there's a lot of sort of unknown and, and discomfort and that sort of thing, your broker can be your friend and your broker teams can help to educate the employees or work with the employees to get to the, to the desired results. So any other questions, Doug, before we move on to the initial renewal process? Okay, good. Thank you. So as we said, we want to try to take you through the process of renewal itself. So we talked a lot about 
some cost containment measures and some things that you can do to mitigate costs or to get more transparency into costs and that sort of thing for the company and for the employees. So now let's pretend that your broker has come to you with the initial renewal and it's out of this world. That never happens, does it? Actually, unfortunately, it does happen on occasion, um, but there are a lot of factors that kind of go into your renewal depending on your group size and what's happening in the marketplace. So Matt, can you talk to me a little bit about what you and your team are seeing in terms of renewals right now? Well, we're, we're really, you know, like, this year's, I would say this year, the 2022, it's been, the the ranges have been wider. Um, I looked at an average uh, of, you know, several of the um, uh, uh, clients we have here at Hub. And what I noticed was I was seeing renewal increases trending at about 4% higher in 22 than they were 2021. Just again, uh, a sample size again of of hub clients. Um, why is that, or 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 you know what's driving that? Well, we know that you know uh, economically, right? We've seen a lot of uh, tremendous inflation across all you know sectors of our economy, and healthcare certainly not uh, uh, immune to that. So you know we are seeing that. Um, but you know again with those. Uh, employers where we're getting data, right? So getting data is really important. And we know some of the employers on this call may not be getting any data. And, and we understand that. And that's sort of this world that we live in where generally if you have less than, a, if you're an employer of under 100 employees, or if you are not at least level funded with your medical insurance, you're not seeing any sort of utilization of your of your medical plan right so you have no idea how the plan's being used how many emergency room visits there are what type of medications are being taken are there any chronic conditions that exist within your population you may not know any of that but for those of you that do that helps us you know with our clients and that would help you with and that would help your broker uh really start to assess and say okay what are some of the options available that we can look at um, to see, you know, what, you know, really, are there any, are there any programs that can help cost, right? Because ultimately, again, what are we talking about here, right? We're talking about, you know, possibly those, those, those larger uh, increases on a health plan um, renewal. So, um, uh, you know, certainly data, data helps, right? I mean, you know, in all aspects of your business, the more data you have, the better the decisions you can make. Healthcare is no different, right? So um, I encourage every employer, regardless of size, to make sure at minimum, if you are fully insured, at least look at a level funded plan. It's truly not gonna feel that different to you at, at minimum but you will gain some benefit in starting to get a little bit of a peek behind the curtain on how your plan's being utilized. You know, I wanna sort of go back a moment to our catapult medical plan and a lot of employers could find themselves in this situation. Catapult was level funded before we moved to the self-insured hero program. And that really helped us, you know, as their, you know, benefits broker because we got we had enough data that we were making educated decisions when we were looking at the self-funded health plan why because a few years ago catapult had decided okay let's make that move to level funding so you know all the employers on here today um you may not be ready to make that full jump to self-insuring and that's okay you don't have to but if you're fully insured today maybe think about that one step to level funding so that you can start to accumulate the data. And then maybe in a couple of years, you're ready for that, 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 that self-insurance. Again, lots of different ways to approach this. That's just one strategy. There's many strategies, but make and, sure- and Matt, Matt, let me, yes. let, hey, let me ask you, so you use the term level funded, you know, let's, let's so you might have, uh, employers have heard the terms marketplace, level funded, balance funded, um, uh, alternate funding. You may have uh, lots of different terms for it, but listen, this strategy, if you're not on it before, you haven't looked at it, or maybe haven't, you know, felt like it was for you, 
this this health plan looks, smells, feels just like the fully insured plan, and they're all available from all the major carriers. Blue Cross has a version, United has a version, Cigna has a version, Aetna has a version, and and you just pay a fixed premium just like you do when you're fully insured every month. Um, if after 12 months you didn't like the plan or you want to change something else, you just leave it like anything else. Um, you know, this has all the controls and the mechanisms that you would expect and the comfort that you would have on your fully insured plan, except for every 30 days, your your advisor and, and maybe you, depending on the carrier, start to get claims data. Did you start to learn about your utilization, the dollar spent? And sometimes what we learn is terrifying. Sometimes we learn that they're sp spending 150, 200% more than we put in. So, you know, we, we have gotten a really good deal for our health insurance this year, but next year we may get a high renewal. And then, you know, Matt, so we talk all about converting over to, to level funded. Talk a little bit about the employer size where that comes into play, but then also talk about the strategy that we're going to look at when you're level funded that, hey, if claims aren't going so well and you're under 50 employees, you can actually go back. And that's not a bad thing at all. We have clients to do it every year. So talk, talk about I just, I just want to make sure we didn't miss that, that once you jump into this, it may not work, may not look so great. That's right. That's right. So, you know, as we talk about level funding, um, generally, if you're an employer that has 26 employees or more, you can look at those options again from all the major carriers that, that, uh, that David uh, talked about. So if you happen to fall in that segment, 26 or more, Make sure you're having those conversations with your with your benefits broker uh, or advisor so that you're seeing those types of plans. But like David also mentioned, those level funded plans run one year at a time. Right. If those claims are really bad, you can leave the level funded plan behind and go to a different insurance plan. Right. If you happen to be uh, an employer under 50 employees. You can always go back to those ACA community rated plans that maybe you have today where, you know, the pricing is based on just the average age of your employees. Right. And again, for those smaller employers, you're, you're likely familiar with those plans. If you're an employer above 50 employees, well, you can go look at what other what all the other fully insured options that are available um, from each carrier. But, you know, again, it's imp always important to remember regardless of the funding strategy, the claims that occur in your plan were going to occur regardless, right? It's not like you had bad claims because you had a level funded plan, or if you had good claims because you had a level funded plan, or you know, or a fully insured plan or a self-funded plan, right? Those outcomes are going to occur. We, we like the approach of knowing why, right? That's why we're, we generally will take the approach of we want our employers that we work with to be aware of these options and we're always encouraging employers to take a very strong look at if they're not ready for self-insuring at least look at again level funding because we want to get that data doug is there some questions coming through yeah i hate to buddy they're they're very relevant to what you're talking about so one of them is around uh, under 100 groups, I'm assuming 50 to 100 or so, I'm assuming fully insured. Um, they, just what you talked about, they're, they're going through renewal now. Uh, the insurer is telling them at least, hey, you're, this is why you've got a bad renewal. You've got two claims or two large ongoing claims that are driving it. Um, what can an employer do in that case? Because they're, they're not getting the day, they're not really getting any, uh, you know, what can they do vis-a-vis -vis their insurer? Say, prove it. I mean, we don't believe, one, we know about these two, one of them, yeah, the other one, I'm not sure about that. That should be really dry. So what do you do in that case? Is there, are there, is there any leverage you can do there? You want me to take that one? I will. Yeah. So um, we we come across that all the time. And again, we're mostly we're coming across that on our fully insured groups, right? Again, those that, that, that traditional model of of insuring your health plan. Again, and this is not to say that's a bad way, because that way that way works for a lot of employers, and and it's a very great program. But you're limited on the data, right? So you're gonna, you know, in in many times, Doug, like like this question indicates, 
you're not going to be able to get a lot of details, right? So, and, but it's worth asking the questions because we have seen times where, you know, there's a large medical condition driving the increase, right? Every employer hears that or, or their advisor tells them that. And what if that person is no longer part of the medical plan anymore, right? They came off the plan a few months ago. Or what yeah, if Matt, the, human resource the, the claim data is the, the claim say of the care you're using. I'm sorry to butt in. I'm, so this is just so frustrating. I hear this all the time, see it every month. So what? You have a couple large claims. Doug, if you have 100 employees on the plan, another 100 members, you're paying 800 grand, a million plus maybe in premiums. We're going to have some large claims. We're putting a million bucks into the kitty to pay claims. A hundred thousand dollar claim, not a big deal. Doesn't scare off or close the door. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollar claim doesn't does not necessarily close the door to any option or creativity going forward. Um, you know, I think and and I'm gonna say it less nicely than that, but you know, I think it's an excuse. I think it's an excuse and I think it scares employers into thinking they have no options. But keep in mind the perspective of dollars that are going in. And to Matt's point, the data they're using often by the time it makes it to the broker, and, and listen, we're no different by the time it makes it to us and it makes it to you, the claims data could be six weeks old. It could be two months old. The member, unfortunately, may have passed away, might have dropped off the plan, might have declined COBRA, uh, might have taken other employment. Uh, when you have a large claim, HR is reasonably often in the loop with what's going on. That member's not at work full time. Uh, it's a member's spouse, and they've had to take time off work to give care to a spouse. I mean, this requires PTO, uh, FMLA. So we get updates all the time that the that the situation has changed. So new data means new ball game. Sorry, Matt. Hope that wasn't too much. But great question from the audience. So it sounds like that. What I'm hearing y'all say is that 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 could be a sign that it's time to consider perhaps a different option. Because uh, she, this person has tried and tried and tried, is getting very frustrated because the insurer has kind of closed it off, doesn't want to talk. You know, it is what it is. Another question we've got similar to that is, so you keep mentioning data, and this is why I say sometimes when we we think of healthcare, we 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 don't always we don't always have our business hat on. I mean, what you say data, I mean, what, what kinds of data when you're level funded or self funded are these employers, are they like, are they seeing like Doug just had a procedure for this or is it, or is it, is it just summarized? Speak to that a little bit. Cause I think that also concerns some employers that, that their employees will think they're scanning all their health records and seeing that so-and-so's daughter just had a whatever procedure. Talk, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I'll take that. Um, the data is PHI protected. Right, so there's not a report that's arriving that says, you know, Doug had a doctor's appointment yesterday for, and here's the tests they ran, and here's the medicines they prescribed. It's not getting to that level of detail. It's showing there's a member who had knee surgery and it cost $20,000, right? N knowing who the individual person is, doesn't really change the type of conversation we are having as a broker. And it doesn't really change the conversation the employer's having, right? So um, as an employer, I would, that, that would, I would not, um, I wouldn't let that sort of uh, prevent me from wanting to look at these models. You're not going to all of a sudden in your email, start getting all of this information from your medical plan carrier saying like, alert, you know, Matt just went to, you know, the hospital yesterday and he had his appendix taken out kind of thing. Um, that's not happening, right? Again, the reporting that you're getting is showing more of the data, uh, you know, da again, data claims data, right? Uh, a, a, a diagnosis code, uh, a brief description of what that diagnosis is and a cost right? That's all that you're seeing. You're not seeing who it is. Um, you would have to really go three or four or five layers deep into the carrier to, e and again, that would be more if you were self-insured, to even see the member. And again, that would be 
so challenging to do, no employer is going to do that. So again, you're really seeing on a monthly basis more of an aggregated number. Um, so you're not seeing all of those all of those little things. So yeah, Doug, it's, it's dollars in, dollars out. Employers ask us all the time. Well, it's paying us three hundred thousand dollars in premium, and a, you know, a little twenty five person group. What do they spend in claims? Well, level funded, we can tell you. We can tell you what they spend in claims. We can tell you generally where they went, inpatient, outpatient. Uh, we can see top 25 medication reports, which are fantastic uh, pieces of information to show what's just, you know, in general, what's going on, what are the concerns, what are the cost drivers in your group. Look at the top 25 med report. So <clears throat> that's what we're talking about, not PHI level stuff. That's, uh, that's, that's more advanced. That's almost uh, self-funding, you know, 3.0. And Matt, final question, just, just give us 30 seconds. So we assume that uh, these terms sometimes can be confusing. When you say level funded, what does that mean? So level funded is you pay a level premium for the whole year. It's set, just like your fully insured health plan, right? You have a level premium of $20,000 a month that covers all of your employees. The insurance carrier bills you. You get to the end of the year and um, the plan reviews claims paid out versus what you've paid in. If there is a surplus, you share in the surplus. If there is a deficit, the insurance carrier uh, ta- you know, eats, the, eats the deficit or pays the deficit. So you're not, you're not paying any more than uh, what you agreed to at the beginning of the year. So in that way, it feels like a fully insured health plan. The additional component is you get the claims reporting we're talking about. So that's at a high level, the main difference. Is it kind of like a hybrid self-funded, kind of a, a kind of sort of light version of self-funding? It is. It's a, it's a nice little sort of, I would say, like you dip your toe into the water of the self-funding pool. You know, you're not committing to what if I have a bad claims year? You're not having to pay anything extra, uh, but you're getting some of the perks like if I have a good year, I get a little bit of money back. And I also get to see my claims information. So those are the two nice key components of it. All right, thanks. That's it. I'm just a reminder, eight eight minutes. Okay, great. So before before we leave the actual pre-renewal discussion, um, I want to talk a little bit more, Matt, because we know that the majority of clients are still fully insured. Um, They haven't really made the jump into a level-funded or self-funded plan. So when they get that renewal, and it's a little bit of a shock, is there any recourse? Is there any negotiation? And if so, what point, what size group has that leverage to negotiate? Well, everything's negotiable, right? Um, and that's where you need to, one, have those conversations with your you know, broker or advisor. And your broker or advisor needs to have those good relationships with the carriers to get that number down, right? Um, I don't think we have any any client that ever takes the first number out, out of the gate. Um, and that's just, you know, it's unfortunate, you know, like we employers don't like that. We don't like that. But that's that's the model today. Right. So um, marketing the plan. Right. So uh, we have employers that, you know, sometimes you may be with carrier A and I'm not I don't want to you know, specifically name anyone. So we, you're with carrier A and you love carrier A and you don't want to make a change from carrier A, but it will benefit you to see what carrier B, C, and D is offering from a plan and cost standpoint, because maybe there's something out there that you didn't know about, or maybe, and this happens, you use some of the information you get from marketing your plan to get your in-force carrier A to reduce their costs, right? So, so that's that's a that's common, right? You know, and then you know, I mean, the reality is in in the situation uh, where you go back to your your enforced carrier and you say, hey, I'm looking to make a move, or your broker does, and from there, um, carrier A backs off of their renewal. So that's one option. Another option that we see commonly is carrier your your carrier comes out with a renewal, and they want to wrap this up quickly. Uh, they don't want you to go out to the market, so they'll say, you know what? If we, if if you, the employer, agree not to bid the medical plan, we will reduce our initially issued renewal. Again, a very common strategy. 
Many employers like that. And, and that's not a bad way to go about it, right? Because if your number one goal sort of going into your renewal is get something that is falling within your budget and you want to li uh, limit disruption, you may want to go that route as well. So there are a lot of different and ways Matt, to approach it. Yep. Go ahead, David. So, well, you know, and the one exception to that is, you know, you said, well, you know, we don't take any renewals out of the gate. Well, you know, the one exception to that are the small group ACA plans. Those are the fixed cost plans. Those are the safety net plans. And so I don't want someone to miss here. You know, you've got 18 people in your company. You're on this call and you're on an ACA plan that's, uh, and you go back to your broker and say, well, hey, Hob said we could negotiate with our carrier. You know, those are the fallback. Those are the fixed, no underwriting, uh, no movement, no flexibility, no creativity. You know, those are the plans for the, the two to 50 employer segment that, again, can be the safety net if self-funding doesn't work out for you. If you try if you try a level funded plan for two or three years. So in that case, you can kind of have your cake. You can do the, the level funded plans or even a creative self-funded plan for a smaller employer um, for as long as it works out. Uh, most people don't ever go back, but if you need to, that those plans are there for you. Um, so I just want to point that out, that that's the one plan segment. And that's what's frustrating as advisors to us, is there's just not much we can do with those plans. You know, we can't impact the outcome year over year over year on those ACA plans. Thanks, David. Matt, anything to add before we move uh, on? No, I, no. Uh, on this topic? Yep. No, I think, uh, I think we covered it. Perfect. Doug, any questions in the chat box? Okay. All right. Sorry. No, no, sorry. Okay. All right. Next. All right. So next, we know that the success of an open enrollment is about employee engagement. After you've made the decision, you've executed, executed on your plan. Now it's time to get in front of the employees and to educate and to get them engaged. And with the move toward the workforce changing, some are remote, some are in the office, some are hybrid. There are potentially five generations in your workforce now. What types of things are you seeing, Matt, that your clients are using from a technology perspective that are helping sort of pave the way and increase employee engagement? Yep, and I'll try to keep this one brief because I know we're, we're up against our, our 10 a.m. So what we're seeing a lot, um, you know, with, with COVID, right, a lot of us went remote. So we are doing a lot of meetings just like this, go-to webinars and Zooms where we're not only reaching employees, but we're having spouses join those employee meetings uh, uh, because you know sometimes the spouse in the old model where you'd have an employee meeting where someone like me was sitting in front of a room talking to employees about benefits, it would only be whichever employees could make it on that day, right? So we're seeing those Zoom meetings. We're doing pre-recorded benefit videos. We are um, we are doing you know brain shark type videos. And those are evergreen, right? So those can not only be used at open enrollment, but they can be used for your new hires during the year. So there's a nice benefit as well. So we are seeing a lot of technology being used in those open enrollment meetings, and that's and that's been going uh, really well. Again, also different ways to reach people, where you know sending out email notices, text notifications, open enrollment postcards. Again, different people consume information different ways. So there's a lot of different ways to get this communicated out and your benefits broker, you know, should have all those options available for you. Thanks, Matt. So another, and another Donna, hey, yeah. I gotta say really quickly, Donna, you you are serving as moderator, but you've done a tremendous job really leading our hub staff on uh, new tools to actually analyze the employee workforce. So, you know, it's it's not just about the enrollment tools and, and how you gather information, but it's about understanding your workforce and, and you've done a lot of that. Is there, you, you want to take a minute? Sure, sure. So utilizing a process where you are really um, looking at your demographic and your enrollments in a little different way um, gives you some insights into really offering a benefit program that speaks to the individual employee generationally where they are and where they are in their career continuum. So arguably, a 26-year-old is not thinking about the same things that a 50-year-old is thinking of. So in order to really minister to all of those populations, you're going to need to fashion a benefit program that speaks to where they are 
in, in their life cycle and their career cycle with you. So um, we're using a process where we're analyzing those personas and really talking about what things are truly meaningful. And then to Matt's point, to be able to take that information that we find out about what's meaningful based on who they are um, and communicating it out in all those different channels. So um, we can certainly talk more about that. That's a whole other, I'm obviously very passionate about that. So um, that's a whole other topic, but um, thank you, David, for bringing that up. That was actually my next question to throw out to you guys. Um, Doug, are there any questions regarding uh, um, employee engagement or open enrollment? I think we sort of summed it all up in that one question. Uh, no, but we, we actually go to 1030, so you've got some more time, sorry. Okay, good, perfect. Oh, good, okay, I was perfect. Um, so open enrollment's completed, your technology's put to bed, the carriers have been notified, everything is good to go. Now what? So post renewal and ongoing communication. So this is really um, outside of the employee scope and really between you and the broker. Matt, I'd love it if you would talk a little bit about what your process is post renewal. Like what is the point of getting together after that and debriefing? Well, you know, um, certainly some clients are like, okay, I've seen enough of you the last 90 days. I don't need to see you again for, for a while. But for those, uh, for, for those that, um, uh, what we like to do is 30 to 45 days post renewal. Um, one of the meetings that we like to have is a debrief, right? Where we're debriefing on what went right, what are some areas maybe we need to address, what are some common questions that came up during open enrollment or post enrollment? And maybe we can also use those as an opportunity to develop a communication strategy throughout the year. For example, um, let's say on the employee meeting, we're getting a lot of questions on how do some of the mental wellness benefits work, right? Uh, whether it's for a child, for an adult, what are the options? Well, if we're seeing a lot of those types of questions, what we want to do is then get with maybe the human resources team that 30 to 45 days after renewal and, and develop checkpoints throughout the year where we're reminding employees of, the ben of some of those key benefits that they asked a lot of questions about and how they access them. So that, that, that's, a, that's a, I think, an important uh, uh, the, uh, item we can take away when we sort of level set and think about what happened over the, you know, during that open enrollment and renewal process. We also get to talk about, you know, what feedback did they get from their actual open enrollment process? Hopefully they were using some sort of technology. And if they were, did that go smooth? Were there some areas that we need to think about that we need to address ahead of time before next year's renewal? All right, so we're always looking at, at, at that. And then also the communication strategy, right? If it was a year in which we did, uh, you know, in-person meetings or a hybrid where we did in-person and 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 Zoom type meetings, how did those go? You know, and then we can also look at like view counts. If we did pre-recorded meetings, well, how many employees viewed those meetings? Okay, if they didn't, why not? How do we get those employees more engaged? So I think I think debriefing. You know, all the time and energy and effort we put in to getting, uh, uh, and, and that's a collaborative effort, right, between the employer and us supporting the employer, um, all the time and energy and effort put into that, we want to make sure that we are now looking back and saying, what went right, what are some areas we need to improve? Thanks, Matt. So I know we've talked a little bit about reporting and data that's available. How often, and we know that data is not available to everyone and that varying degrees of data are available based on group size. Can you break down what a company should expect based on say under 50, 50 to 100, 100 plus self-funded versus fully insured? What should they expect to see and how often should they be reviewing that information? Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's take that first category, under 50 employees. If you're under, if you're 50 employees or less, and you have a traditional fully insured plan, there's really no data to review, right? So, I mean, that, the, uh, and, and there's no impact you can have as an employer. If you're under 50 employees, but you have a level funded health plan, which we've talked a little bit about today, where there is some claims data, I think you wanna review that information 
uh, at the midway point of your plan year, right? So you review that at the midway point, and then you'll also get a, a refresh prior to the renewal. If you are 51 to 100 employees and you're fully insured, again, there's not any data that's coming out of the gate, right? So again, there's not really much you can do there. The, those carriers are not providing it. If you're 51 to 100 employees and you're level funded, like we talked about, the frequency is I think you should be having quarterly uh, claims reviews. Again, they're high level. They probably take 30 minutes, 45 minutes on Zoom. You know, sometimes they can be had over lunch, you know, those kind of things. So uh, that would be the frequency um, level. If you're fully insured over 100 employees, again, I think doing a once or twice a review a year, you know, maybe again at that six month mark, that would be appropriate. If you're level funded over 100, I would also go quarterly. You know, I think that that, I think going any more frequently than that, if you were level funded, it's probably a little bit of overkill. Uh, but now let's talk self-funding because self-funding is a, 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 a kind of that next step. So if you're under 100 employees and you're self-funded, I think a quarterly review does make sense. Um, if you're maybe towards that smaller side, you might be able to stretch it out to six months, but um, I don't see any downside in doing a quarterly review if you're self-insured under 100 employees. If you're over 100 employees, we like to do a monthly claims review, right? So we're, and you're self-insured again, self-insured over 100 employees, monthly claims review. Um, Hub, like many of the other brokers I have to assume out there, have their own sort of proprietary uh, claims reporting tools and software. Uh, we develop ours. We like to put those in front of our clients on a monthly basis. Um, and by doing that, we are then tracking claims, uh, identifying um, uh, things that arise in the plan, and then being able to address those sooner if we need to, uh, but also preparing, right? I mean, it's all this is all part of a preparation process so we know what's coming down the pike. Now, if this happens to be your first year in one of these mechanisms, particularly self-insuring, the frequency is gonna be stretched out a little bit because the data doesn't start to flow in until you're about three to six months into the plan year. So just keep that in mind as well. I see and Doug's on the line. Matt, Any question? Yeah, they have one, one question, David. So again, kind of back to our earlier question. So. Give us some examples uh, with your self-funded clients. When you say we get we reviewed claims data monthly, and then based on that we do something. What, just give us some examples of do what? What what types of things would we we be changing or doing in based on that data? David, you want to take that one, or you want me hey, to? Take sure, sure. Yeah, I'd love to take that. Great question, Doug. So you know, part of what Matt just talked about is hey, understanding how the plan's running. You know, but a lot of that is, you know, it's backwards looking, which is important. And it's, um, you know, we want to see if our money's being spent. Are we winning, losing in our plan? How's it going? But, you know, what Doug uh, just fed me a softball is really, you know, how do we look forward? And, you know, part of the reporting that we're going to get uh, and the, the job of an actively managed plan, I love that term, an actively managed health plan. Uh, the job of a Mako RX, of a Smith RX, of a of a of an engaged PBM, is to identify specialty drugs, identify high cost brand name drugs, reach out to the members themselves directly, and help them define not just take a different drug. You know that can be a, a great approach, but they're actively managing um, to. Uh, you know, helping someone to, to maybe make a switch in a drug that saves them hundreds of dollars per month in their health plan. Or uh, they've identified that Humira that shows up on every single one of our clients that we get uh, most popular brand name drugs, especially drug in America, the most expensive drug ever invented. Um, we, we find a Humira on the plan. Okay, well, 70% of the time when we see Humira on a self-funded health plan, uh, we have pharmacy partners that can reach out and find actually alternate funding for that medication that costs five to seven thousand dollars per month is the cost of Humira. So, uh, and hear me very clearly, I did not misspeak. With 70% effectiveness, 
we're able to allow the member to continue taking Humira, but we take the $60,000 plus dollar annual cost of that drug off of your health plan. And that cost is paid by the manufacturer of Humira. Your employees actually qualify often, 70% of the time qualify to have the manufacturer to pay for in full those super high cost specialty drugs. So, you know, we're looking at the claims data that's coming in every month and then looking for uh, to hold the programs accountable that we put in place to reach out and see if there's another way to, uh, to fund that drug, a smart drug substitution that might be applicable. Um, but I've got two clients in particular. We've just had re uh, re reviews with them. We've taken over a quarter million dollars of drug costs off of their plan. Now, the members are still taking those drugs, and the fantastic part, the members are thrilled with the program because what that program actually does is it takes off their copay. So they actually get the drug for no copay. And those specialty drug copays are running 100 to $250 per month. That's a lot of money for the folks out there. For me, it's a lot of money for me. Um, <clears throat> so, Doug, we're taking the information that comes in and then deploying the programs and tools that we put in place if we, again, we've created an actively managed health plan and we're reaching out to the five, 10, 15, 20% maybe, and that's an extreme high side, of folks that are actually driving the cost of the plan. The vast majority of your employees get a card with a familiar name. They just go to the doctor once or twice a year. They get a prescription every month. Their life never changes. It looks and feels exactly like they had before. But healthcare is the ultimate example of the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of the users drive 80% of the cost. And honestly, it's more like the 10-90 rule. 10% 10 of the members drive 90% of the annual plan spend. So, you know, finding programs to help those 10% have better outcomes, both, uh, both health outcomes, but also financial outcomes, that's what we're talking about here. And that's what we're doing. That's what makes an, a plan actively managed during the year. Thanks, David. Doug, any other questions regarding the post-renewal reporting, anything like that? Sorry, uh, no, I, I just, I think these, these kind of come back together. I mean, I, I, I know that uh, we've had it here and, and you mentioned Hero and people here like hero but sometimes people don't like to be actively managed can you talk to that i mean how do, how do you how do you actively manage someone when they don't want to be <laughs> you want so you know that's a that, that that's a really good question doug because um these you know the employers we work with like they're not at the um level and i mean these levels exist but they're not at the le levels where like these things are required right um th these are sort of a soft entry way in letting members know that it's available but having the members understand that you know particularly with hero like you mentioned like they don't have to go to the provider that nurse faith recommends now they probably should because nurse faith has so much good information right but they don't have to um, they don't have to part, you know, in some cases, they may not have to participate in the drug program that David was mentioning. However, they should, because they could be saving hundreds of dollars a month in copays to get those medications, right? So there are, I mean, again, we have to, we have to remember, you know, if you were to look at your medical plan cost as an employer, and what it was five years ago or seven years ago and what it is today it has gone up substantially so the reality is at some point that becomes unsustainable so some of these measures have got to be put in because health care in this country is not going down right? every day every year conditions become more complex and our wonderful scientists and physicians find ways to treat those but that comes with a cost, right? So we need to, it's sort of a, we need to find a, a comfortable middle ground between employer and employee 
to where we're promoting these programs, understanding that these are personal decisions, but understanding that we also need to put some cost mechanisms in place or else next year, we might not even have a medical plan because it's become so unaffordable. Matt, is, is there a line? I mean, I think about, because you think about when it's an employee and you've got this condition or your daughter or son has it. I mean, all you want to do is doctor said, go here. I'm going to go there. They said, take Humira. They said, take whatever. I'm doing that. Is there, a, is there a legal or ethical line? I mean, what do you do with employees that just absolutely, to David's point, the 10 percent maybe you've got two or three employees that are spending 500 grand a year because they refuse to listen to get the drug from canada or prescription assistance or whatever what do you do then I mean, is there a line you just can't cross or do some employers cross the line and say they take the risk hey employee we're gonna make you do it how do you handle them? i'm curious well you know you have the map oh go ahead Matt, i'd love to I'd love to take that. So, Doug, I can't stress this enough to folks who are on the call. The vast majority of our plan, uh, of our clients who have taken a, I'll say, even the first or even most aggressive active step in putting in a self-funded health plan that has some cool features, all of them have a card in their wallet or their purse that has a national network that lets them go see 97, 98% of the doctors or more in North Carolina and facilities and they can just go about their business some things happen behind the scenes um like just finding a, a more cost efficient may, way to pay for this medication some of that stuff can happen automatically as a part of the member do anything um <clears throat> so i can't i cannot stress enough that we're talking about adding to and providing opportunities for people not taking away you know we we i'm not a big supporter of the super heavy-handed approach um you know you you got to have buy-in you've got to walk before you run all the cliches any you know whatever you want to say there um so we're, we're talking about adding to and providing opportunity and education not taking away and even though most of it's voluntary is structured in a way that the benefit is so great to the employee uh to the member they love these new resources they've never had before they just blindly go wherever they go and do whatever they do with no information less research goes into where i'm going to have that mri and then follow up where i'm going to have that surgery and then goes into buying a new washer and dryer you know with so many more tools online to help us figure out which washer and dryer we want to spend our two grand on then you know how we're going to have a fifty thousand dollar knee replacement so you know some of the programs have in place i saw the nurse that we talked about again the layer on add to a plan features added to a plan that's optional for employees the nurse pulled a real surgeon up in front of me the surgeon scored a 25 on average from centers and medicaid uh services cms data um they were scored a 25 they were in the bottom 25 25th percentile for spinal surgery. Well, that's terrifying, right? I would never, ever have any way to know that if I had an appointment scheduled with that provider. But then she could also show me that same surgeon was like a 92 on um, knee replacement. So this was a knee doctor, a really good knee doctor, who was occasionally called in to do something really outside their comfort zone. They weren't very good at it. I would want to know that as a member and having access to that, I think is really cool for me. Like Matt said, I'm not forced to do it, but why wouldn't I want to just get that opinion, get that data? Thanks, David. Doug, any other questions on this topic? Uh, nope. Okay, perfect. So we want to talk about something that really um, was added to the agenda really kind of at the last moment, but something that I know all of you find thrilling, very exciting compliance. So everybody on this call, no doubt, has heard about machine-readable files and probably has a lot of questions about machine-readable files. Um, there was some new information released on the ACA of the affordability levels. So Matt, while we have you, if you could please just kind of talk broadly about what you're hearing, what's new, what questions do you feel like um, are probably in the heads of most of the people in attendance, that would be great. And Doug, I expect you may have a few um, questions come as a result of this opening this category. 
So, um, you know, healthcare transparency has been a uh, very popular uh, and highly discussed topic over the last few years, right? There was some legislation changes, right? Because as consumers of healthcare, we have no idea what anything costs. You just sort of go in, you have a procedure, you may find out a little bit on the front end, but then you sort of just wait and see, okay, how much is this all gonna cost? And if the, if the provider did anything additional, what is gonna be some additional out of pocket for me, whether it's a complicated procedure or some sort of diagnostic test or medication or doctor's visit, what have you. So um, the ca insurance carriers and employers have some sort of responsibility here there's a, gonna be a phased in approach towards this movement towards healthcare transparency. And the first step many employers may have seen in the month of July, they were provided links, likely in most cases, to what's called machine readable files. You may have clicked on one, your computer started smoking, you couldn't open it, the file, uh, but if you did, it none of the data made any sense to you because you need to have special software, special type of uh, machine to be able to read that file. But you were asked to, to sort of link to it. So that doesn't really mean much to anyone uh, on this call today, solely because you know you and your members can't do anything with it. But what is what we're what we're being told is in 2023, the next phase of this healthcare transparency is going to be able is going to have to provide members with true cost data that allows you to do a little bit of cost comparison between providers uh, between different organizations right so um that is coming um again we've heard a lot about it right so you may want to know you know for those of you in um let's say let's those of you in wake county uh, Raleigh in the Raleigh area of North Carolina, you may want to know what does an MRI cost at Wake Med versus what does an MRI cost at Rex? And if I have Blue Cross or if my company's moving to United Healthcare, what do those what do those services cost? You're going to be getting some of that data. Now we have not seen exactly what that looks like and how it translates, but in David's example about you know, putting more research into washer and dryer purchases than an MRI, um, we're going to be getting closer to you being able to do that same type of comparison, right? And again, why why is this why is this coming? Because we want because you know overall in the United States we want to have more um, uh, engagement from consumers and make though you know and give you more power at your fingertips when it comes to accessing your healthcare. The other goal of this is, and we will see if that actually happens, is maybe we're gonna see a little bit more leveling of costs and seeing these providers and the insurers having to get a little bit more aggressive on their pricing because now that's out in the open. Thank you, Matt, for providing some clarity around something as yep. clear as mud. Um, mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about the ACA affordability changes and what impact that might potentially have on, on the folks on the call. Yeah, so that's a, that's something new, right? So that was, I mean, really talk about a new bullet point added to our agenda today. So yesterday, uh, we learned that for 2023, the, for, and this, is, this applies to, to be clear, what's considered an applicable large employer. So employers that have more than 50 full-time equivalent employees. Um, you may have heard, or you may have had to monitor over the years uh, what you're asking employees to contribute towards their lowest cost, towards the lowest cost health plan you offer uh, because of the uh, Affordable Care Act affordability threshold. Well, currently today, uh, you may have seen a percentage, it's 9.61%, so you know, the, your broker likely does this for you, but you take a look and you look at incomes of your employees and you're saying, okay, we're not asking them to spend more than 9.61% of their income that we pay them uh, towards their employee-only medical insurance. Well, uh, HHS announced 
uh, in the last couple of days that for 2023, that number is going down to 9.12%. So what does that mean for you as employers? And, and we're going to start having those conversations with our employers, which is there's going to have to be some budget discussions, right? Because health insurance, as we all know on the, on the call, generally goes up every year. Well, if what you're, if what you're allowed to ask your employees to pay is going down, right? It's going, it's going down about half of a percent, which could be, you know, $10 a month, let's say. Well, if health plan goes up, what the employee can pay goes, goes down, that's going to increase the delta and maybe put a little more additional financial responsibility on the employer. So these are things that as all employers we're going to be advising, like we have to start thinking about what we're going to do in 2023 in, in, in this case. Again, a pretty nuanced conversation, uh, but important for all employers, particularly or all employers that are 50 employees or larger to think about, because that's going to be a big topic in 2023, you know, when you start diving into your medical plan renewal. So for context, I mean, that sounds massive. I mean, do you have a sense just for, you know, maybe your client base, is that going to affect a lot of employers? Is it just a certain type of employer or certain industries? I'm just curious. Um, I see, I, I see it. So I, when I look at kind of our client base as a whole, we probably have 20%, 20, maybe 25% of employers that sort of tow that line of, making their health plan affordable because you know health plan costs have gone up right so you know over the years they've modified the plan deductible to increase it while trying to offer a plan sort of at that at that what i would consider you know bare minimum cost if you find yourself in that scenario you're going to have to closely review this right if you're an employer where you're offering a no cost plan or your low cost plan is 25 or 50 or 75 dollars a month for your employee only cost this this doesn't apply to you this is not going to even register on your radar but if you're an employer that's been towing that affordability line and and those of you that have you likely know what i'm talking about because every year you're sort of crunching the numbers and you're saying okay we have our lowest paid employees are 1250 or 15 dollars an hour here's what we can offer the plan for um, if you find yourself having those types of conversations each year with your benefits broker, this change is going to impact you. Thank you, Matt. Doug, You're any welcome. other clients related questions that have emerged? Uh, no, surprisingly, okay, not. usually well, compliance equals questions, but no. Yeah, everybody loves compliance, but that means that Matt did a spectacular job explaining it. So thank you for that, Matt. Yeah, either um, that or they're tired. <laughs> um, so th thank you guys very much for tuning in. Um, just as a matter of recap, we've talked a lot about disruption, transparency, control, planning ahead. Um, if, if there are additional conversations that you all want to have offline, the Catapult team knows how to get in touch with us. We're very happy to have those conversations with you, um, and you can take the information back and apply it to your renewal and your process as you see fit. Um, and if there are no final questions, that's all that we have for today. And really, really appreciate the opportunity to be in front of you all and to share the information. It's been our pleasure. Yes, thanks. Thanks so much. I'll thank you on behalf of all of our participants. Thanks to the Hub team, Donna, Matt, uh, David from London. It was a great, great session. I think it just shows you, know, you don't have to make a massive leap to, to dramatically improve not only your cost position, but also the benefits that, that you offer your employees. And we all know in this market we're in now, trying to attract and retain, this is part of it. And this is one of those things, unlike a lot of things you do, this involves the spouses. And a lot of times the spouses are not going to be as, as uh, forgiving as the employee might be. So everything you can do to make this better uh, is, is, is a wise investment. So thanks again to really speaking very practical message. I like the actively managed message. I like the that there are options out there, many options, regardless of your size. Don't just accept status quo. There are options. Uh, and I always love to hear that 10, 10%, 90% rule. It's very interesting. So again, everyone, thanks for participating today. We, there will be an email with links to the recording. 
Uh, I know that, that Donna, Matt, David are happy to talk to anybody that has questions. If you want to just ask us, we'll get you in touch with them. Uh, you'll get an email from Julia later. So again, thanks again. Have a great rest of the day and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.